Hi, I'm Joy Elam, DAV National Legislative Director. Dr. Stone, thank you for taking time to participate in this very special forum. I know how busy you are for your caring for our nation's veterans and managing the veterans health care system during the pandemic. As you know, DAV is celebrating an important milestone this year, our 100th anniversary, a century of serving our nation's ill and injured veterans, for which we're very proud. Like most large gatherings, unfortunately, DAV's national convention was canceled due to ongoing public health crisis. However, given these uncertain times, we thought it was especially important to provide DAV members an update on the status of VA healthcare services for veterans using the VA healthcare system and what's ahead. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected every aspect of life in the United States, particularly our nation's healthcare institutions. In March, to keep everyone safe, the VA had to quickly pivot to alternative healthcare delivery options to care for veteran patients. VHA did an incredible job quickly expanding telehealth services and ensuring enrolled veterans had access to their doctors for routine care, medication refills, and treatment for COVID-19. Dr. Stone, could you please give us an update on how things are going, lessons learned over the last few months, and what veterans have, what options veterans have today for VA care? Well, Joy, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, thank you for the support that you and DAV have shown throughout this in some pretty difficult days as we've worked our way through. Congratulations on the 100th anniversary and what a great organization representing, I think, a million of us that are disabled veterans. And, and we appreciate all you do and the role that you've taken. And uh, frankly, just the collegial nature that you've worked with us through this and as we've tried to make things better. Um, you know, we began working uh, with this pandemic uh, back in January. It was actually the end of December uh, when we began talking to our emergency operations people about this new virus that is trans had transmitted from animals to humans. And then in early January when the, uh, the virus first went human to human is when we stood up our emergency operations center. We have uh, worked hard to make sure that we had appropriate access to health care for our veterans. And uh, remember that we do about 300,000 visits a day uh, normally. That dropped to about 100,000 visits a day. And uh, remember that those other 200,000 still needed some sort of care. And so we've had a tremendous increase in telemedicine, We've had a tremendous increase in telephonic calls, and uh, we've been working hard to make sure that everybody has gotten cared for well. I'm very, very pleased that throughout this, urgent health care needs have been cared for in the same rapidity, so just as quickly as we were doing before the pandemic. And uh, it's a great testament to the creativity and innovation of the VA workforce as they've gone through this. Uh, so today, we're back up to around 170,000 visits every day face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, our surgery has recovered to about 70% of what it was before. Um, our ERs are just about as busy as they were before. Um, and um, urgent care uh, out in the community, which was a new benefit for us as veterans, mm -hmm. Uh, had dropped off very significantly, and uh, that has come back up to about 80% of what it was. Great. Well, I can attest, as a veteran who uses the VA healthcare system, VA did not miss a beat um, right in March. I had a scheduled appointment. I thought it would likely be canceled, but nope, they reached out. Everything went fine and had a great uh, visit and felt very good that I was able to keep that and not postpone any needed, you know, care. You know, Joy, that's, it's one of our, our greatest concerns is that we don't want veterans to put off their care. And we recognize that there, there are veterans that feel uncomfortable or have on chemotherapy, things like that, that uh, they're uncomfortable going out or coming in, and we need to work through with that. You know, there's another area of great concern for us, and, and that is um, 
our, our caregivers. You know, our caregivers have had a tough time going through this, and we have almost 20,000 families in which there's a caregiver uh, for one of our disabled veterans. And uh, we're working hard to make sure that uh, there's appropriate respite for them, that they have appropriate supplies, and that, uh, that we're, we're sort of watching for every possible complication that could occur and trying to I interrupt that. Sure. Well, I know caregivers um, is a really important issue to DAV and DAV members. So many of them have a caregiver and wanting to make sure they're safe as well. Um, is telehealth still the best option for veterans who may be at really high risk? Um, well, I think we can mitigate risk face to face, but yes, telemedicine or video visits um, are a way in many, many cases for veterans to be able to get care while not taking the risk of going out of their home or coming into the medical center. We are very pleased though that at every medical center there's a pre-screening that's done and once you get through the, the pre-screening then we've worked hard to make sure there's appropriate distancing uh, within waiting rooms that people aren't waiting too long that we try to bring every service to the veteran in the treatment room so that people aren't having to move around the facility uh, like we did before the pandemic when people might wait in a waiting room for pharmacy or in a waiting room for laboratory. Uh, so we're working hard to make sure that we mitigate that risk. But, but video visits have been very, very popular with veterans and are up very dramatically. You know, the beauty of uh, telemedicine for the VA was that we already did two million telemedicine visits a year for our rural veterans or veterans that it ju they just wanted to be seen that way. So our ability to expand has been uh, really dramatic. The other thing that's little known is we do a lot of, uh, of telemedicine in intensive care. Uh, there is a shortage around the nation in all hospitals of intensivists that care for critically ill patients. And uh, we have uh, multiple telemedicine hubs for intensive care, and we've expanded that fairly dramatically during, uh, during this pandemic. That's great. I think, um, you know, that's a question of, you know, all veterans have is that if I do get sick, is VA going to be able to take care of me? Are they gonna have enough beds? Um, we know there were a lot of challenges in the community with regard to you know, some states even now that we're experiencing um, high levels of COVID. And I think um, you know, veterans would like to hear, um, you know, if they get sick, can they count on VA? Do they know they're gonna have access to the critical care they may need? So we operate about 10,000 med surge beds and about 1,500 ICU beds. We reconfigured ourselves and actually grew by over 4,000 beds early in the pandemic. Because of that, we were able to offer 1,500 beds to critically ill uh, Americans that were not veterans. And um, I can tell you that as of today, uh, we're in very good shape when it comes to bed capacity, ICU capacity. We also purchased a mobile ICU, uh, unique in the world, uh, and uh, it is now in Oklahoma City, and there are 12 veteran patients in that uh, mobile ICU uh, because we knew that Oklahoma was an area that was uh, struggling for hospital beds across the entirety, not just VA, but the entirety of the system. And as such, we've been able to decompress um, the uh, the, uh, the beds in the Oklahoma City and the Muskogee uh, VA hospitals. Um, that also brings up the point that we've been able to take uh, veterans who are infected with COVID out of the state veteran homes run by the states, but there's been some pretty high profile outbreaks of COVID and we've been able to bring many of those veterans into our hospitals to care for and, uh, and to work to save their lives. That's great. We know, um, as you mentioned, how hard hit some of the, the community care centers, living centers were. Internally, VA has the community living centers. Um, how were those veterans affected? Um, we know, 
you know, there was maybe some limited um, ability for, you know, people, visitors and such. Is that still the case right now, just to maintain their safety, or um, has that changed? So the, uh, we operate 133 nursing homes, uh, would call them our CLCs, our Continuous Living Center. These are, uh, have about 8,000 veterans uh, on any given day uh, that are housed there, that call that their home. Um, we uh, are very, very pleased at the fact that our infection rates have been dramatically lower than other nursing homes around the nation and the state veterans' homes. And uh, it is because of the very robust physician staffing as well as very robust nursing staffing that we do. Our uh, patient to nurse ratio is much more like an acute care hospital. And uh, because we run it in that manner, our ability to do infection control, to understand how to put on and take off protective equipment, how to isolate patients. And, uh, you know, very early on in this, we thought we could run COVID positive and COVID negative hospitals and CLCs. Um, it is not possible to do that because so many people come in from the outside with COVID not even realizing it. And we're able to run COVID positive and COVID negative neighborhoods. And in those neighborhoods of a facility, we're able to protect people and been very pleased at uh, how well we've done. In fact, we've done uh, work in supporting American nursing homes and literally hundreds of nursing homes across 47 states. The most painful thing that I think that we have had to do uh, is to cut off visitors for uh, those veterans and especially those veterans with dementia or cognitive decline uh, really need visits from their families and uh, we had to do that because we had to protect the veteran population and uh, I, I think if you were talking to the secretary, he would tell you that that's one of the most difficult decisions that we made very early on. And uh, it was tough for many, many families. We've been able to work through, through the gracious support of, of many of the, of, uh, the, the great industries that support us uh, with some iPads and things like that. We've been able to do electronic visits but there's nothing like having your family with you and and that's still been a tough part of what we're doing is the limitation of visits right i think i saw a message from uh from va coming out too that maybe volunteers would be allowed uh, coming back at some point um you know their role has been so important in um and many dav members are, are volunteers and the facilities. Do you see that um, come, you know, happening in the near future? I do. In fact, uh, on Wednesday, uh, two days ago, uh, I was just up in uh, Chicago, North Chicago, at the Federal Health uh, Center up there. That's a combined Navy and VA facility, and I was actually surprised to see two um, volunteers there uh, that were helping uh, do some screening and they're going through the same testing that our employees do uh, that are doing that kind of job, but it was great to see volunteers back in the facilities because it's such an important part of connecting our community of veterans together. Yeah, our members have you know, really missed being able to do that and they want to help out wherever they can, so I know that's a welcome, some welcome news for them. Um, if a veteran needs a test, um, or feels you know that they might be becoming sick or might be COVID positive and they want to find out just to make sure what's the best um, what's your best advice should they call the VA Medical Center first or do they just need to go in yeah they should if, if they're not sick or think they're in the early stages of sickness they should uh, call their primary care team and their primary care team will help them through the process of being tested or not. Mm -hmm. I think though that if they're really sick and they're having trouble, they need to come into the ER in one of our institutions or go to urgent care and get through that process of being taken care of. The uh, faster we get at this, the better in helping them through. Um, and so what one, one of my biggest concerns is I don't want people putting off care because of fear of coming in. 
So a phone call first, contact your medical center, and uh, if, if there's appropriate time to do that. But if you're really sick, uh, let's, let's get you into the emergency room where we can work through every one of our emergency room will have a screening outside of the emergency room that will separate the potential COVID positive from the COVID negative patients. That's great. I think that will be reassuring um, for veterans. And I think VA's also put out, um, and you've talked about just, you know, there'll probably be a temperature check, mask wearing in the facility, social distancing, even having veterans maybe even notify them from their car when they get to their appointments so they're they're not um, having to be in the facility but come in you know when their appointment is when they're ready to be seen yes um, so. yes all of those things are true and and just like you and i are wearing a mask just like you and i are socially distant all of those things will occur in the institution or in the CBOC if they're going into a CBOC. Uh, all of those things will occur in order to protect us and also be aware that unless you need a uh, assistant to be with you during the visit uh, for whatever reason uh, your visitor or someone who might come with you will wait outside in order to protect everybody in the institution just trying to keep at a minimum who the, the people who really need to be there and to keep everyone safe um, just two last quick questions on the health care points um, and how quickly are you getting tests back or does that differ at different locations? Depends on the need. We have rapid tests for the sickest patients and those will come back within 45 minutes. Uh, we have another series of tests that come back in five hours and then we have some that come back 24 to 48 hours later. But uh, we are still sending out to some states in some visions and those can take two to three days to come back. Um, we uh, have just been going over those numbers. In fact, today I'm going to go over some of our testing numbers. We're trying to become completely self-contained for testing. But as you know, in different areas of the country, testing is run a little differently. And so, but our idea is to get for the sickest patients uh, that we can get testing back as quickly as possible. Great. Another uh issue I just wanted to bring up because I know a lot of veterans this is a really uncertain time and very stressful time and some veterans might be struggling due to the isolation just you know the stress of everything happening with the um, with COVID but VA has really emphasized that addressing your mental health is part of addressing your whole health and I know that is an important um, piece especially during that period what can veterans um, expect? Is VA doing any special outreach to veterans to make sure they're continuing if they were had, um, you know, mental health visits that they were doing routinely? Um, how about the vet centers? Are they still um, seeing veterans? Um, what's changed or what's happening there? So we've done very significant outreach with the vet centers. In fact, we've put the mobile vet centers on the road into many communities, uh, and they've moved around the country. And uh, over the last many months, they've gone to some of the most hard hit areas to reach out, and they've, they've touched over 10,000 veterans uh, as part of that outreach. In addition, uh, when appointments started being canceled either by patients or by us, in uh, mental health. One of the taskers that went to all mental health teams was to reach out to their veterans that their appointments were being canceled to make sure that they were okay. Uh, intense isolation and the stress of uh, potential job loss is something that we worry about a lot. And we know that uh, veteran unemployment was down in the low 3% and has jumped up to almost 10% and has now come back down to 8.8%. But that financial stress uh, adds to the social isolation. And if there's anything we talk about today that is important, uh, this is, is absolutely the most important. If you're struggling, call the crisis line, call your care team, come into one of our ERs or the urgent cares to, uh, to really talk to us and, and, and let us get re-engaged with you so that um, we know that you're well cared for. And um, 
We've, uh, we, we're really very concerned. We've got lots of capacity in our mental health units. Uh, we've been very careful with uh, protecting people in those units uh, from COVID. We've had very few problems and it remain, remains a very robust delivery system for mental health. And uh, the uh, vet centers have been an important frontline effort for that. Now, in the vet centers, they're still doing face-to-face -face visits, but it, if the veteran wants, we can also do that as a video visit or a telephone visit. Great. Well, that's good to hear um, because I know when we interface with our veterans or members who call DAV, we're making sure we always check on our veterans, make sure that they're, they know VA is open, ready for business. You know, if there are mental health issues, you know, make sure that they reach out, reach out to another buddy or, you know, reach out to VA directly. So that's, that's great news. Last series of questions. Um, looking at the upcoming flu season, there's been a lot of discussion just in the news, you know, that we have a potential for a really difficult period coming up with both the flu season and, and COVID, just still challenges in the country that we're facing in terms of um, reducing the spread of COVID. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, what's VA doing to prepare for that? You know, what do you see for the months ahead? So two respiratory viruses in the community at the same time that are as severe as uh, influenza as well as COVID is just unacceptable. And we must do everything we can to protect uh, veterans uh, with immunization. You know, last year we had over 4,600 admissions, 600 admissions to the ICU for the flu. If we add that to what we currently have for COVID, uh, it'll put us in a very difficult situation and put America's veterans in a difficult situation. So we have ordered extra immunization for uh, influenza. We will begin distributing that next month uh, for this. We've also mandated uh, for the first time that all of our employees receive um, immunization unless there's a medical or a religious reason that they shouldn't. Uh, but uh, we must reduce the amount of influenza now. There is good news, compliance with masks, and we as veterans are pretty good at following orders. Uh, our compliance with masks, we think as veterans, is higher than some of the rest of the American population. Uh, isolation or social distancing will help reduce the amount of influenza. But more important than that, it is getting your flu shot in a timely manner will protect us. So we're, we're hopeful. Uh, we've been working for about three months now on the influenza campaign. And uh, you'll begin to hear more about it. And we'll need your help at DAV to reinforce this to make sure we get people in. There's lots of places you can get your flu shot from local pharmacies uh, are able to do this to throughout our, uh, our system and our urgent care system um, that is out in the commercial network is able to do so. That's great and I, you know, I know we'll be happy to help you know, push that message out because since VA did uh, go to the community um, you know, at your local CVS or other um, pharmacies where you can get the flu shot, I mean, that will help because a lot of times we always went to the VA and made sure we just stopped. They used to have them, you know, right there in the, in the atrium so that you could just quickly get it without doing so. I'm sure you're going to provide some instructions on, you we know, are. with regard to that going forward. And we'll start that communication campaign over these next few weeks. Great. Um, the other last thing I just wanted to ask about was research. You know, research is such a cornerstone of the VA healthcare system, and we appreciate that it's so veteran focused. Um, have, have, is VA involved in any research projects for treatment uh, of COVID? Uh, we are. Uh, in fact, there's no portion of COVID therapy 
that uh, we are not involved in research. And uh, from development of the vaccine, uh, participating in Operation Warp Speed, to examining medications and innovative ways to ventilate patients uh, who are struggling with, uh, with breathing uh, during their COVID infection. In fact, uh, as you and I are speaking, there's more than 80 studies here in the VA that are ongoing. We were just recognized in the Swedish literature as being the innovators in how to decide when to put somebody on a breathing tube and a ventilator uh, versus the advantages of not doing that. Um, and so I'm really proud of the system and how quickly it's stepped up. We've, uh, we've broken uh, down a lot of bureaucracy to get studies going quickly. And uh, we're, we're really pleased at the work that's going on. Great. Well, we expect nothing less from the VA, always on the cutting edge, I may add. Dr. Stone, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk to DAV members about these important issues. I know that there is a lot of uncertainty for everyone these days, but one thing is without question is clear. Uh, VA doctors, nurses, and clinical support staff are working hard every day to care for our nation's veterans often at personal risk to their own health and well-being. And I know this pandemic has touched you and your family personally, and what an incredible responsibility you have for coordinating care for millions of veterans every day. So on behalf of DAV's more than one million members and our auxiliary, we wanna thank you and all of VHA employees for your commitment, your dedication, and your tireless efforts to care for those who've served. Dr. Stone, before we close, I want to provide you an opportunity to just make any final comments, anything that we might have missed that you'd like to just share and make sure our uh, members hear directly from you. Well, just I'd like your members to recognize what a great partnership there is between your leadership team and our leadership team and how proud we are of that relationship. Uh, I, you've heard me talk many times, we can't do this alone. We need your help and we need the, the role that you play in helping to communicate and helping to inform your members. We're humbled to do this work. Our, uh, our employees are very, very proud uh, to do this and proud of the role that we've taken throughout this uh, unprecedented time in American history. Well, we appreciate that. Um, we know, again, how hard you've worked and what a personal toll it takes to be on call, I'm sure, 24-7 for these months that have um, uh, followed. And But you've been a tremendous leader. We appreciate your cooperation, you. your collaboration with DAV. You've been on all the calls, trying to keep us informed as much as possible. And so we really thank you for that. So with that, um, we want to make sure that VA employees stay tuned uh, to view the DAV Auxiliary virtual salute that we're going to do in place of our national convention, which is going to be on August 26 at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And that can be viewed at DAV.org slash virtual salute. And that will include honoring our awardees for the top VHA, VBA, and NCA employees of the year. And that's been a tradition, and we, don't wanna, we didn't want to stop that, and um, our leadership made sure that that's going to be a big part of our virtual salute, and that we recognize um, those um, employees in throughout VA that have really done a stellar job. They've gone above and beyond, and much appreciated by our membership. So I hope that your um, employees will tune in. I hope you'll have the time to do that and make sure that you see the recognition and how much we appreciate all you do. Thank you, Joy. Thank you very much.